charge of the meditation practice. Yeah, it means 
basically that delusion is the root cause of suffering here. This is what this means. Isn't that interesting here? It's quite interesting, isn't it? Because uh, obviously the reason why people uh, come to the Buddhist teaching is precisely because they realize that, that life is often problematic, that there is suffering in life, the problems, uh, and this that tells us what the root cause of that suffering is. Uh, yeah, so it's, quite, it's actually quite interesting, it's actually very useful there. Uh, so the, these 12 things, what they show us, that they show us how, starting with delusion at the very beginning, uh, how, the, how the, that transforms from delusion all the way into suffering on the other end. Uh, and it's quite a, it's actually a very interesting sequence. I won't be able to go through all the 12 things tonight, uh, unless you're willing to stay very long. I don't want to stay until midnight, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> actually, that. But actually, usually often what I do is I'm going to give a retreat, I go through the dependent retreat in great detail. Yeah? So it goes over like nine days or something, and that is when you really get the full details of this. So we're going to have to do it quite fast, but that's okay. Yeah? Because sometimes you need a more review, sometimes you need to go in depth. So. so the general idea is here that delusion somehow transforms into suffering. Yeah? Why is that the case? How can you understand that? And actually, when you think about it, it's actually very obvious why that must be the case. If you are deluded about the way things work, yeah, what does that mean in practice? Well, in practice, it means like, you know, you, uh, you, know, you are in a new place, yeah, you don't know where the toilet is, and you can't find the toilet. What is that? It's suffering, yeah, you can't find the toilet. That's one of the most desperate things in life, where you have to go, but you can't find it. So that's kind of delusion, you know, the directions of the path to the toilet. It's a bit like the eightfold path, the path to the toilet, the eightfold path, the there's kind of a, there's a certain similarity there. You don't understand the path, so you can't get there. Then. So it's very obvious when you think about it that delusion, if you, are, if you are confused about reality, if you are confused about how to get to point, from point A to point B, you're going to suffer as a consequence. Yeah? So the idea that delusion somehow must lead to suffering actually is very intuitive. It's very easy to understand why that must be the case. So for this reason, the whole purpose of the Buddhist path is really to eliminate that delusion at the beginning. And by doing so, you eliminate each of these stages going through all the 12 things until you eliminate suffering itself. That sounds good, huh? Sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah? <laughs> I think it sounds really cool, that. And in one way, it is actually very nice, but in one way also it actually underestimates what actually is happening on the path. Because when we say that suffering disappears, often sound a bit bland as well, yeah, suffering disappears, so on. But, of course, the reality is that with the elimination of suffering, yeah, the opposite side of this coin, there's always an opposite side of every coin, the opposite side of the palm of the hand, yeah, the opposite side of the coin is that you also find the highest happiness. That is what it means to remove suffering, you also find the highest happiness. So not some kind of bland, non-suffering state, but actually it is the highest happiness experience of all by a human being or any other human being for that matter. Yeah, so if you, you are not a Buddhist, yeah, you're probably new to this thing, yeah. does this sound good or what? Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But this is what the rest of the set, right? So now you kind of you get, get an idea of what it's all about. So, so uh, uh, this is, uh, so that is uh, the two end points of this dependent realization, delusion on the one end uh, and suffering on the other one. Uh. So what, does, uh, what do we mean by, let's start off with suffering here. What does this actually, how can we look at this in a way that is very useful? Right? And one of the interesting things in the Sutta is when the Buddha talks about suffering here. Yeah, when the Buddha starts out on his quest, to, you know the history of the Buddha, his life, life story? Yeah, you story? But the life story of the Buddha, most people think they know it, but actually they don't. Uh, because for the majority of people, the life story of the Buddha is what kind of is taught uh, in traditional Buddhism, the kind of story that has been evolved over the centuries after the Buddha passed away. If you want to know the real life story of the Buddha, you have to go back to the earliest sutta, the suttas where the Buddha actually talks about his own life. Yeah, that's where you really find out about what the Buddha's life was about. And what he says there is actually very revolutionary, very interesting. We're used to thinking about the Buddha being a Bodhisattva. He made a vow under some uh, previous Buddha, Sumedha. He was, he was Sumedha, the Buddha Vipankara, you know, four incalculable eons ago, whatever, to be a Bodhisattva and practice the path and become the Buddha. That is kind of a traditional story there. But is that what actually happened then? Well, if you read the, the earliest suttas of the Buddha, what the Buddha himself says in there, when he talks about his own life, it's like his autobiography, if you like it. What he says is that he saw one problem in life, 
or rather a kind of a conglomeration of problems. And these problems was illness, old age, and death. Yeah, this was the problem that he saw. And he uh, started out, you find this in the, in, in the Pali Canon and the early suttas. Uh, and the Buddha says, well, this is a problem in life. I have, you know, this is what I'm faced with. Uh, and then uh, I go out into the world, uh, yeah, and I seek other things uh, that are subject to exactly the same thing. Uh, I already have a problem for myself, for goodness sake. Uh, now I seek other things that have exactly the same problem. Uh, I'm multiplying a problem that is already there. Wait a minute. Is this, is this wiser? Maybe I should do something else. Uh, yeah, you seek for the, the Buddha, it's not the Buddha, it's the Buddha to be, yeah? You seek for wife, you seek for all these possessions in life, uh, maybe for children down the track and all these kind of things. Uh, but of course, human beings uh, are also subject to all their illness and death. Uh, all the possessions, in a sense, are also subject to death. Why? Because you're going to have to lose them eventually. Uh, yeah, but they're for what they're gone. Uh, so I have this problem with myself. Now I go into the world seeking more. Surely, this is not very wise. Uh, so the Buddha then decides what I need to do instead of seeking for other things that have the same problem as I have, I should seek for uh, the freedom from these things, the freedom from death, the freedom from old age, the freedom from illness. But really, the freedom from death is really what it comes down to, because death is the thing that unifies old age and illness. Yeah, that is kind of the uh, the, the major thing in a, in a person's life. Is that down the track somewhere, you're going to have to die. So this is uh, what made the Buddha, not the Buddha, the Buddha to be, made him go forward uh, to decide to become a monastic, uh, to leave the household life, uh, and try to find a solution. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it, actually, it's so wonderful when you read these kind of ancient stories, uh, because actually it's very audacious. Yeah, you say, yeah, I have this problem, I'm going to die, let me leave the household life, go into the forest, do some meditation, and find a solution to this. Uh, isn't that kind of uh, amazing? Uh, how many people do that? Do you know anyone who does that? Uh, Nobody does that. Yeah, I have this problem. I'm going to go to the forest and find a solution to this. It's very powerful and very, I think, a testament to the Buddha's incredible wisdom. And actually, not only wisdom, but perseverance, and energy, and all these kind of things. And he was willing and able to give up his ordinary life because he saw a problem and tried to seek a solution for that in the forest. Nobody does that. Yeah, it's just unheard of. Perhaps not unheard of, it's extremely rare that people do this. So, uh, this is what he does, uh, and of course, as a consequence of that search, uh, eventually he finds a solution to this. Uh, that solution, then, is, of course, the end of suffering. Uh, but it's very fascinating uh, that the idea of death that we all going to die uh, was sufficient for the Buddha to go forth uh, and to actually seek a solution to that. Uh, and that tells us uh, that there's something very powerful about the idea of death. Uh, if we use it in the right way, we think about it in the right terms, uh, actually is going to have a similar effect on us. So the problem is that we think we know about death, but we don't really know about it. It's a very shallow knowledge, it's a shallow understanding. We haven't really internalized it properly yet. And because of that, it doesn't have the same driving force for us as it had for the Buddha to be there. That is the problem there. But it shows you straight away that if you actually do think about this in the right way, it actually has, will have a very powerful how do we think about that in the right way? And one way is precisely what I was just talking about now. When the Buddha understands that all the things in the world are also subject to that. Yeah? When you think about your own life, look at the vast majority of people in the world. What are they searching for? They're searching for perhaps material possessions, they're searching for social status, they're searching for career success. Yeah? And if you start looking for the things, looking at the things that people are searching for in life, you realize that all of them are bound up to this very life. Yeah? All of them will stop. Once you die, it's all going to stop. Your social status in this world, your career status, the possessions you have, the relationships that you have, even your physical body, it's all going to have to go. Yeah? The moment you die, it's all going to have to go. So once you understand that, then, and you also take into account the idea of rebirth, but it opens up a vista, opens up a viewpoint, a way of looking at the world that is radically different. If all you do is invest your time and your resources in things that end with this life, what does it feel like when you're going to die? What it feels like, it feels like it. What have I done with my life? Yeah, here I am. I spent all my time investing in things that end now I'm going to die. And you feel like it. 
It's also pointless. It's also purposeless. Uh, everything I've done in my life now has to come to an end. I have to leave it all behind. I can't take it with me. I've invested all my time in my possessions, in my relationships, in my status. Uh, and on the way of doing that, uh, I've also done things that weren't so good. Uh, yeah, I've done the moral things at the same time. Uh, so not only have I spent time investing in things I can't take with me, uh, at the same time I've also kind of made a, a bad mental state for myself, which is precisely what I take with me into the future life. Uh, this is what happens when you die. Yeah? So if you think about death in this way, uh, and you take into account the Buddhist idea of rebirth, this is why the idea of rebirth is so fundamental in Buddhism, because it changes your calculation of what actually matters in life, what is important to what does you know long-term perspective in Buddhism really is long-term, yeah? It's like uh, this is your life here, and this little like, tiny little space of time, and it kind of goes out like that, think, whoa, this is what it's like. Uh, okay, my investment strategy has to change. Uh, Monks are investment advisors, yeah, you were not to advise investments, sir. Invest in the life of my cash. So how do we how do we do that? What does it mean to change your investment? Does it mean that you have to become a monk or a nun straight away? You are welcome to if you want, sure, yeah, we can even let me help you afterwards uh, if you wish to do that, but it doesn't actually mean that. What it really means is that you have changed your attitude to life. It is not so much what you do in life that is important. Yeah, you can even be, you can be almost anything except having a really bad thing like, you know, being a, uh, maybe being a butcher or, or something like that, killing lots of animals, of course, is such a good idea. Uh, but you can almost do anything in life, but, but it is how you do it that really matters. So it is the how in life that matters. So do you do things with kindness? So do you do things with compassion and a good heart? So do you try to imbue your life with wisdom and understanding and peace? So that is what matters. So and if we do things in the right way, then it doesn't matter so much exactly what we do. So this is what you understand when you look at the big picture. Actually, how I live my life, what qualities I imbue, all my actions, all my speech, every single thought that I have, do I imbue with kindness, or do I have ill will, or do I have all this negative traits instead? That is what, how it actually turns out. So, this is the power of a very, very simple thing like understanding death. If you understand death correctly, then, yeah, if you understand the problem of dying, then, then actually it changes your attitude then, and you look at things in a brand new way. Then. This is why it is so powerful. And this is why death is considered such a major obstacle. Then, and why it kind of heads it. It's like the head of all the sufferings in life, death is at the top, and everything else kind of fits in under that in a certain way. Then. So that is uh, suffering. Just very briefly, we could go on about that for a long time, and yeah, I'm sure we could kind of, you know, it's very interesting suffering, because sometimes people think that if you kind of just enumerate all the suffering is in your life, yeah, somebody said something bad to me, I got a knee, I got a headache, I kind of, all the food wasn't so nice, whatever it is, that means understanding suffering, but actually it doesn't really mean that. Uh, understanding suffering actually means reflecting on it, understanding the deep perception of the way that it means understanding death, first of all, but it also means understanding suffering from the viewpoint of meditation practice in particular. Uh, and that's where it starts to become very powerful. So understanding suffering is really about insight. Uh, it's an insight into reality. It's not an enumeration of phenomena that, that are suffering. That's part of it, but that's only a tiny part of what suffering really is all about. So anyway, I'm going to leave that for, for another time. When I come here next time, I'm going to that. Then another time, as soon as possible. Okay, that probably means 10 years or something. So, uh, yeah. no, I'm not sure what it means actually. So, what about the other side of the story? So, the other side, the root cause of this problem we call suffering is then delusion. So, what about delusion? What can we do about that? So, in the, one of the beautiful things about it in the suttas is that what, one of the great things about being a monk, we have read so many suttas, yes, yeah, so I can draw the Buddha's wisdom from here and there and pull it all together. And in a, one of the suttas, the Buddha explains that even though delusion has no first cause, yeah, there's no first cause of delusion. If you go back in time, if you were able to see your past life, so you wouldn't find the first point where delusion started out. And the reason for that is because delusion is a self-perpetuating force. So, yeah, if you are deluded, by definition, you don't know what's going on. And because you don't know what's going on, it self-perpetuates on and on and on. That is why it is kind of scary. You know what I mean? If it's self-perpetuating, then it kind of, gee, this is scary. 
yeah, what's going to what's going to happen with me? I need to find some kind of key to unlock this whole thing. Yeah. yeah. So and this is of course what the Buddha's teaching is all about. Is that key here to stop that self perpetuating force, which is illusion. Yeah. But what the Buddha does say, yeah, and what is interesting, that even though it is not first source for delusion, yeah, there are nutrients to delusion. There are things that make it stronger, that make it grow, make it more powerful. Yeah. And the thing is that make the illusion more powerful is known as the five hindrances uh, in Pali Buddhism. You know about the five hindrances? Uh, you don't, yeah? No, okay, that's okay. Because uh, these are kind of uh, these are kind of crucial elements of the Buddhist teaching, the five hindrances. Uh. But these are basically defilements of the mind, yeah? Uh, they're headed by things like ill will and desire at the very top, uh, and these are kind of the two most important ones. Uh. So the illusion is supported by ill will and desire. So this is the good news, sir. because practicing the Buddhist path, one of the key aspects of practicing the Buddhist path uh, is to reduce the defilements. Sir. Yeah, this is what is really all about. This is why we practice virtue. This is why we practice kindness. This is why we do meditation practice. Sir. Because all of that together, if you do it in the right way with a, with a sense of investigation and reflection, these hindrances go down. And as the hindrances go down, you have this delusion. Yeah, that's good, isn't it? Sir? Yeah. I'm just kind of see if it's responsive. Good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. That is great. So all we have to do is if you reduce the delusion, simply by removing the hindrances, the delusion goes down, and all the twelve links also go down, and you have that suffering as a consequence. So this becomes what the path really is about. Reduction of those defilements, down and down and down, until you eliminate them completely. And when they are completely eliminated, of course, that is when there is no support, there's no nutriment for delusion anymore. It becomes very weak because there's no nutriment, and that's where it can be overthrown. Right? And we can actually eliminate delusion once and for all. Right? So this is what uh, the other side of the path is about. This, this talk is not just about dependent origination, it's also about dependent liberation. Right? That sounds even better, doesn't it? Dependent liberation, yeah? So we can talk about that in a second. But this gives you a hint about where dependent liberation, what it is all about. It is about eliminating those hindrances, uh, starting with ill will and desire, eliminating it completely, and then finding liberation as a consequence. But uh, before I do that, hey, this path is open so fast that this is scary. Okay. So before I do that, I want to say a few more things about dependent origination, because it's such a beautiful teaching here, and it's very, I think, some of the critical things very important to point out so you kind of get some uh, get a rough grasp of what this is this is actually about uh, so part of this uh, sequence of the 12 men starting with the illusion and the suffering yeah, part of this uh, is the idea of rebirth uh, yeah so it shows us not only how delusion ends in suffering yeah, but it shows us how delusion ends in suffering through the process of rebirth uh, yeah that is part and parcel of what this is about so, and this gives you a very clear idea of you know, what the problem is from a Buddhist point of view. The problem is really this cycle, samsaric cycle of getting reborn again and again and again. And this is really ultimately what, what is the problem here. So, rebirth is a fundamental aspect of part and parcel of dependent origination. The other thing that is very important in dependent origination is the idea that consciousness itself is conditioned. I said before, if you remember, I said that. Uh, from consciousness, you have Nama Rupa, Nama Rupa is name and form. Yeah? And uh, there is one sutta which points out that Nama Rupa, name, this is a Pali term, uh, name and form in English, Nama, name, same word, yeah? These are all Indo European languages, so Pali and English are very closely related to each other. I happen to be Norwegian, same thing in Norwegian, yeah? Uh, Nama, French, Norm, yeah? That's all the same word, all these Indo European languages. So, Lama Rupa, name and form, and this sutta points out that uh, not only is consciousness the cause and condition for name and form, name and form is the cause and condition for consciousness. Uh, these two are mutually uh, conditioning factors. Uh, they depend on each other. And the Buddha used the simile of the two sheets of straw. You have two sheets of straw leaning against each other like this. Uh, if you take one away, the other one falls. Uh, take the other, other one away, the other one falls. Yeah, so they depend on each other. They are not independent entities. Uh, and this is uh, one of the most revolutionary teachings of the Buddha. One of the most fascinating things. Uh, because at 
that time in ancient India, two and a half thousand years ago, the predominant teaching was the Brahmanical teachings, and this is the precursor to modern day Hinduism. And of course, in modern day Hinduism, they had this idea of the ultimate self, the Atman. Yeah, the Atman, the kind of the uh, final uh, essence, if you like, of a human being that unifies with Brahman when he passes away. Yeah? And this is the essence of what it is to be a human being. But the Buddha comes along, he says, there is no such thing as an Atman. There is no independent self, an inherent essence, a kind of personal identity which is always there. This thing doesn't exist. Consciousness, you have the sense of awareness, the most basic thing that we have as human beings. Consciousness just means the ability to be aware, and get to know, and to actually be aware of what is going on. That's what consciousness is all about. That most basic aspect of what it is to be a human being, that itself is conditioned. And this is the radical insight of the Buddha, and this is perhaps uh, considered the most important of his teaching, because this underpins the whole teaching of anatta, of non-self, and all these things. It, it underpins that idea, the mutual conditionality of consciousness and name and form of the other matter. Because what this means, it means that if you somehow are able to eliminate name and form, yeah, Consciousness itself is eliminated. If you eliminate consciousness, you eliminate name and form. Name and form, we can roughly think of it as all the other aspects of experience. Yes, of experience is awareness, but it's also feelings, it is also uh, perceptions, it is the will, and all of these kinds of things as well. Yeah? So, all of these other aspects of experience condition consciousness, and consciousness is dependent on this for their existence. So this is the radical teaching of the Buddha. He actually teaches a path to the elimination of consciousness. Yeah, are you ready for that? It's pretty, it's radical, yeah, isn't it? But what is, and it sounds kind of scary with the elimination of consciousness. We must be kidding, you know, I've come to the wrong, I've come to the wrong place. <laughs> okay. <laughs> People think, whoa, I'm in the wrong place. This is just too much. So, and of course, the, the point is that the Buddha says, well, actually, if you want to overcome suffering, yeah, this is what you want to do. This is what you have to do. If you want to find the highest happiness, this is actually what you have to do. This is the path to get there. Yeah. So if you think of it in that way, of course, then actually it's quite acceptable. Yeah. But this is, uh, in many ways, the most profound aspect of the Buddha's teaching. So, you have this idea that consciousness itself but is inherently dependent on other factors. So, remove the other factors that consciousness itself disappears. Yeah, if you feel that sounds a bit over the top, a bit scary, don't worry too much about it. I'm just kind of throwing it out there because it is such a fundamental part of what Buddhism is about. It's good, I think, to know about this thing. So. so these are three of, I would say, the most important ways of thinking about dependent origination. Yeah? It's the idea of understanding that suffering ultimately is caused by delusion. And it is the idea that it actually involves rebirth as an inherent part of it. And the idea that uh, it shows the mutual conditionality of consciousness and all the other aspects of experience. Uh, yeah, this is a kind of three very important, but it's a very rich teaching, and as you investigate it, as you understand it, uh, you actually start to pull it apart and you start to understand some of the rich, richness of what is going on here. Yeah. But before I go on to dependent liberation, uh, uh, I can't see, I can't, oh, I can't even see this much anymore. Yeah. It doesn't matter how far I hold it away. Usually your arms are too short, yeah? After a while, the arms aren't even short. It's nothing to do with the arms anymore. It's got to do with, I don't know what. That's, that's my kind of system. What? Did I read from it? Yeah? Or did you go to it? Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. I can't see it. I was kind of bent. More out of it than I can see before. I think that's great. The other one gets very boring. I don't know about Ajahn Brahm, by the way. You know Ajahn Brahm? Yeah, you want the Ajahn Brahm, okay. So he's kind of the master of kind of exaggerating just a little bit sometimes. So I kind of learned that from him. So please, say, it's not my fault. Um, <laughs> <laughs> conditionality, yeah. <laughs> but very briefly, before I go on to uh, the idea of dependent liberation, I want to just very just touch on very briefly about how this process of conditionality works. So especially starting from the beginning, because it sounds so cryptic. Yeah, that delusion going to intentional activities going on. What is actually going on here? And the idea, what is actually going on here, the idea of delusion, 
there's many ways you can look at this illusion, but one of the most profitable ways of looking at this illusion uh, is to understand it in terms of the three characteristics of existence. Uh, yeah, according to the Buddha, he says that existence has three characteristics. Uh, impermanence, uh, yeah, or unreliability, if you like. Uh, you can't really rely on things. Things are always changing and becoming something else. Uh, and because it is impermanent and unreliable, the second characteristic is that of suffering or un uh, unsatisfactoriness. Uh, because you can't rely on them, because you can't hold on to them, uh, they disappear, people die, yeah, uh, things, get, things kind of get stolen or you lose your possessions, whatever it is. Uh, it's unsatisfactory, it's suffering. Uh, and because it is unsatisfactory, it's suffering and impermanent, uh, it means that when you analyze yourself in the right way, when you look inside yourself, uh, you can't actually find any permanent essence inside of you. This is the idea of non-self. These are the three characteristics of existence. And normally, we don't get this. Yeah, this is what we do with that. Normally we think, yeah, things are kind of permanent. Yeah, or we don't actually think that, but we kind of feel that in a deep way. We, don't, we haven't really taken on board the idea of permanence fully. So there is some, a, a kind of a, almost like a feeling. It can be very hard to pinpoint. And things are much more reliable than they really are. Yeah, and that's, that's the first aspect of it. The second aspect is that we have a tendency to seek for happiness in the wrong place. We seek for happiness in the things that we belong to this particular life. As I was talking about before, yeah, enjoy yourself. Yeah, there's so much nice entertainment in London. Is that right? London is a great city. Yeah, all this entertainment is a wonderful place. So enjoy all the entertainment, enjoy all the kind of the coffee bar. I don't know what's in London anymore. I've lived in for, I actually used to live in a long, long time ago. So that's, that's ages ago. That's almost like a past life now, actually. This proves past lives, yeah? It proves that they're past lives. Not quite. But. So, um, so, so, and this is what people think. This is what the world is like. To enjoy yourself, have a relationship, you know, enjoy all the pleasures of the world, you know, have a nice job, and all these kind of things. So we go out searching because we don't really understand where happiness is to be found, where true happiness actually lies, and we see it in the wrong place. So you start off with delusion, not understanding what happiness is, and that leads to all these intentional activities. This is how I translate the word Sankara. You may have read uh, English translations of Sankara, volitional formations, yeah? Does anyone here understand the, the phrase volitional formations? Uh, I don't, uh, yeah? I was reading this for a year, but I it made absolutely no sense to me, volitional formations. Uh, so you have to translate it in a way that is meaningful for people. So intentional activities, uh, kind of makes sense, yeah? Activities means speech, it means actions, it means thought, and they are intended. We actually want to do them. That's, like, that's actually much more, to my mind, a very useful translation of Sankara. So when you don't know where happiness is to be found, or you think that happiness is to be found in a certain place, you start acting to get that happiness. Yeah, if you think that happiness is in relationships, is in enjoying yourself in the world, it's kind of having a career, having, you know, kind of boosting your social status or whatever, and then you put effort into that. You start acting accordingly to boost these things. It's natural. So delusion leads to all these activities, uh, and you try to kind of get hold of these things. Uh, yeah, and if you have no concept of the importance of morality and ethics and kindness and all these kind of things, uh, in your search for that, that happiness, uh, if somebody gets in your way, yeah, you want that relationship, somebody else is there, and you do some bad things as a consequence. You get that kind of rival out of the way, because they're kind of, it's a bit of a trouble if you're interested in the person as a rival there. Okay, you do some kind of slightly dodgy things to get rid of the rival, yeah? People do this kind of stuff all the time, right? Because obviously relationships is one of the really big things in life for most people there. So what happens if all you do is search for happiness in the sexual world, you have no idea of the importance of ethics and morality, and what you're going to do, you're going to start to do bad things sometimes. Sometimes you do good things, and that is right, but if necessary, you also do bad things. Why? Because you're searching for happiness. You think that's where happiness lies, so of course you're going to do bad things as a consequence. So what happens is that in life, depending on kind of your idea of what matters in life, you start to do all these intentional activities. Yeah, some bad, some good, some neutral then. And if you do a bad intentional activity, if you say something nasty to somebody, you do a bad act, how do you feel about yourself afterwards? Yeah, you feel a bit bad.
as you reduce your delusion, you start first of all to do more good actions, less bad ones. And as a consequence, you do the right kind of attention activities, you lift your consciousness up, and then you start to do meditation practice. And, and as you start to do that, you realize actually all these intention activities themselves are actually a pain on the backside. And, yeah? So you don't do any more intention activities at all. And you get into some incredibly profound states of meditation. And you start to understand that this actually is where real happiness is to be found. Where you do no intentional activities whatsoever. In there. And this is where you start to see the escape from samsaric existence. No delusion, no intentional activities means no level of consciousness anymore. If consciousness doesn't have any level, it means that there is no experience that matches with it. And consciousness stops right there. This is called the exit from samsaric existence. Yes? No? Maybe? Maybe. Say maybe. Okay. It's okay to say maybe. Yeah? It sounds kind of cool, but we don't know. So, <laughs> this is uh, the rough and actually very good idea of what dependent origination is, is all about. If you understand that basic principle that I've been uh, uh, kind, of, uh, kind of trying to make out now over the last 10 minutes or so, if you understand that, uh, you understand a lot of what dependent origination is about. Uh, it goes on for another eight links afterwards, but really it is almost like a repetition of the first links, the second and the last eight, and very much a similar kind of idea that it is about. So, um, now dependent liberation. How does this all fit in with dependent liberation? And uh, the idea here is to eliminate delusion at the very beginning of the path. You start to understand, one of the things that you start to understand that I was just mentioning now is that living well, living with kindness, uh, avoiding doing bad things, yeah, hurting other people, animals, whatever. Uh, yeah, this is very important to be able to lift up your mind to make yourself feel better. Uh, so this is where dependent liberation starts. Uh, you understand something about suffering in life. Uh, and when you understand something about suffering, uh, the consequence of that is that you start acting and living better because you know now where to find happiness. Yeah? When you live better, if you do this in a very systematic way, with perseverance and commitment, what happens? What happens is that you start to have less remorse, yeah? less regret about how you live. Because you have less regret, you start to feel more joy in life. Yeah? So this idea, how they were called pamuja, which means like gladness and joy, starts to arise. And this is where we come again into meditation practice. When you meditate, you sit back, and, yeah? And it's quite, it's quite beautiful here. I don't know if you noticed before when you sat back, and you just feel the atmosphere in here. It's quite nice, yeah? And part of that niceness is just not, not just the external atmosphere, but actually the atmosphere inside of you. Know? When that atmosphere is positive, the joy tends to come by itself. The joy comes in. And as you keep on watching the breath, or doing your meditation, whatever it is, that joy becomes more powerful. And the joy eventually moves into tranquility. You know? And tranquility becomes an even more profound source of happiness. So, yeah, and I'm just quoting basically the idea of dependent liberation as it is found in the suttas. So, that profound sense of happiness that comes when the body and the mind are completely tranquil, that, that leads to what is called samadhi. You know? And samadhi in Buddhism is a deep and profound state of meditation when the mind becomes absolutely still and unified, you know? and there's no movement. In mind at all anymore. All craving, all desire, all volitional or intentional activities, all of that has completely stopped. You find complete peace of mind for the first time in your life. And that is one of the first radical, really radical experiences you can have on the Buddhist path. Because what it shows you, yeah, that normally in our life it is full of activities, running after happiness all the time, trying to find happiness there, craving for this, craving for that, uh, using our intentional activities to try to get us the stuff that is important in life. But, and now, for the first time, we realize the thing that we were chasing after all this time, yeah, that craving was driving you on all this time, actually, you find that by giving up the craving, uh, by, com by becoming completely still inside, uh, you actually find that thing that you were searching for all along. Yeah, that is radical. It is incredibly radical because you realize the world is actually completely upside down. It is by not chasing after the stuff. That is how you find real happiness. Sir. And when you find that profound happiness and contentment inside of you, when craving is completely gone, there's no more desire, it feels like you have found the answer to the meaning of life. 
That's what it feels like. If you have no drive anymore, if you don't want to do anything anymore because you feel so utterly happy, so utterly content, so utterly blissed out. After. It feels like, if it feels like you don't want to get out of the sea ever again in your entire life, but that is exactly the idea of the meaning of life. That is what it means. So this is why this is so exciting, yeah? When you get into the meditation, you start seeing this thing, you start to see things that you had no idea actually were possible. Yeah? But that is not the end of things, yeah? And the reason it's not the end of things, this is only the first taste of the idea of the meaning of life. Yeah? You realize that even the samadhi is a condition state, it comes and goes according to condition phenomena. So you actually have to go beyond that. Uh, and so then you use that samadhi as the basis for insight. Uh, yeah, you have in the uh, in this famous sutta, which is called the Pen Liberation, it says uh, samadhi is the upanisa. Upanisa means like uh, immediate cause or proximate cause, something like that, for yatha buddha and anadasana. That sounds, sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I'm just saying this probably words that sound a bit more impressive. As a, <laughs> as a teacher, you have to have authority, yeah? So if you use lots of probably words, you get more authority. That's why I'm doing this kind of thing. So, Etta Ruta Nadasana. I'm not going to say it in English because then I give away the game. Right? No, no, no. <laughs> it means seeing things in accordance with reality. That's what it means. So, based on that samadhi, because your mind is so uh, set over and it's so together and because there are no departments in the mind anymore that that is the moment you have the ability to see things in accordance with reality. Yeah? And what this means, of course, when you see things in accordance with reality, uh, I am not seeing things in accordance with reality. I think they are all open and they are actually out there. So, okay. so when you see things in accordance with reality, what is that? It is the exact opposite of delusion. Yet yeah, delusion means not seeing things in accordance with reality, almost, almost by definition. Yeah. So you can see here how this undermines the very first factor of dependent origination. Yes, yeah, seeing things in accordance with reality brings us back to the starting point, which is the very first factor of dependent origination. That is destroyed. Delusion is gone. You're seeing things clearly now. Yeah. So what happens then? Yeah? Well, what happens then is that you get this opposite sequence called dependent cessation. Yeah. Yeah, so when the delusion is broken, delusion has sensed that all the other factors of the dependent origination cease one by one, one after the other. So from the cessation of dependent of delusion, you get the cessation of intentional activities. The cessation of intentional activities is the cessation of consciousness. The cessation of consciousness is the cessation of name and form. And so it goes all the way up to the cessation of suffering itself. This is how this whole thing ultimately comes to an end. There's a beautiful part, yeah? It is wonderful. Some of the things that I did mention about this thing, which uh, maybe you caught as I was saying this, uh, but one of the marvelous aspects of this part, of this part of dependent liberation, uh, is that, well, first of all, it leads to seeing things according to reality. Well, that's the most important thing. Uh, but what is so beautiful about it uh, is that it is so much about happiness. So much about joy, so much about tranquility, so much about these wonderful things that everybody wants in life. Yeah? From the idea of living a moral, upright, and a life of kindness comes joy, comes happiness. From that comes tranquility, comes more happiness, comes samadhi, where literally you start to understand the meaning of life for the first time. Isn't that astonishing? Every factor of this path, this is actually the path of meditation itself, is all about happiness. Yeah. Would you like some more of this or what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what I can kind of read is that, oh, jeepers, you know, why did I become Buddhist a long time ago? They're wasting my time. This is what everybody wants it. Yeah. So that is what it's all This is what is so powerful about it. Of course, it doesn't mean every time you sit down, you're going to become miss out and become very happy. That's not what it means. What it means is that this is what this path, when the path works, this is the result that this path actually gives. It's so beautiful and so powerful. And you start to experience this as you do the practice. So gradually these things build up in your life. Yeah? It's so wonderful what that happens. So. And if it doesn't happen, it basically is because uh, you're not doing things quite right. And you need to ask yourself, uh, what am I not doing quite right? Uh, yeah? But if you commit to this, if you persevere with this, uh, eventually these things will happen as a consequence. More and more joy, more and more happiness, more and more tranquility. Uh, more and more harmony with your fellow beings. And on top of that, there's additional bonus to that. Yeah, this is what is so hard to, uh, much, much harder to see, but it doesn't really matter so much, 
is it also destroying the illusion and you may have the final end of suffering as a consequence as well. Yeah? Win-win, win-win. Win-win-win-win-win-win-win situation. Yeah? What does win-win is really win-win? Yeah? So, <laughs> anyway. So, there you are. That is a little bit uh, dependent on origination and dependent liberation. Maybe not to what it's supposed to do. So, uh, that is uh, probably all I want to say on this topic, at least for now. Uh, and I always like to open up for questions, for comments, or complaints. Oh, please don't complain too much. Yeah, I think it's not so much. If you really have a complaint, okay, but you know, not talk too much at least. But, but if you'd like to ask some questions or comments on what I've said, you are more than welcome to do so now. I always like to remind people that what I said now, if you ask questions, uh, you're going to become more intelligent in the future life. Yeah? Does everyone here want to be a dumb dumb in the future life? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, at the back there. Yeah. Are there all right? You mentioned that uh, one should leave, leave their life so at the end they can, they can be happy because they are higher, well, it, it's better than when they, where they started. Yeah. But how do you know where you started? When you uh, okay. Well, if, if what you do is just you kind of feel the life, whether you have a general kind of movement or what is it? Yeah? You don't know exactly where you can't. I mean, unless you can remember being a baby, you know, but that's what kind of you just hear whether you have a general movement of the mind or next level of that is. But one of the great things about reading the sutras for yourself, right? Have you read the sutras? Do you feel you listen to me? Okay, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, remember, I was the filter, yeah? So what you get from me, I was the commentary, basically. So, you know, sometimes you can read it for yourself. But anyway. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, one of the things that you start to see when you're in the sutras for yourself, sometimes you get hit that really powerful for you. Uh, the Buddha has a lot of similes, he has a lot of short, succinct teachings, and sometimes you read something and think, this is so really marvelous, yeah, this is just so beautiful and so great, and I, this kind of really makes sense to me, and nobody's ever told me before. Huh? And this is the problem, whenever you listen to talks, what you get, you get excerpts of the sutras, uh, yeah, you get a little bit from there, from the here, but you never actually have a comprehensive overview of what is there. So the only way to really find out if there are teachings that are really, you know, that really hit you home, so to speak, in a very profound way, you have to read it more, read it for yourself. And one of those things that I found that was very powerful for me, and that I had never heard before, and I read the teachings, was when the Buddha said, um, how do we make decisions in life? How do we kind of decide whether if you're a monk, for example, should I stay in this monastery or that monastery? Should I have this teacher or that teacher? Yeah, I've kind of stayed with and Brown for 24 years. 24 years, is that too long? Should I go somewhere else? Yeah. You know, it's like after a while it gets fault finding. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't know, I'll say the same thing again. Yeah, same old story. I don't know, I don't want to hear the story again. But then I think, wait a minute, that's not the point of monastic life. Yeah, to not hear stories of the hear stories. And, and that is what the Buddha says, the point of everything here. Is are you improving in wholesome states and declining in better ones? If you are, you are on the right track. And you should, if necessary, if you are asked to leave the monastery by the abbot, you should chain yourself to the front gate. Yeah, it's like being an activist, you have to chain yourself to the front gate. <laughs> this is how monks are activists. So the Buddha actually said that. And this is what is so cool about it, is that if you are if you are doing what is the whole purpose of the monastic life, improving wholesome states, declining in the bad ones, uh, you should refuse to leave if you're told to leave it. Isn't that kind of nice? Uh, because, and the reason is because you are fulfilling the purpose of this life. Uh, that is all we have to do. As long as you are improving the good states uh, and you are declining in the bad ones, you are fulfilling the purpose of the spiritual life. You know you're heading in the right direction. You know one day you'll get the results of the path. Uh, never look for specific results. Uh, Never ask yourself, oh, when am I going to get jhanas? I want jhanas, please, this retreat, give me jhanas. Yeah, that's the wrong way of thinking about it. The right way is, am I improving or not? That is the right way. Yeah. Because you cannot hurry up the jhanas by wanting them. In fact, you slow them down by wanting them. Yeah. So instead, you kind of take a, a different approach to these things. So. Yes, and have I asked the question? I have no idea whether I can even remember the question anymore. I see it. <laughs> anyway. Ha, okay. Yes, sir. Is this not in the Hindu tradition the same as in Buddhist, like uh, Kundalini? Is that some other in, uh, in Hindu tradition? Is it the same? same? I, it is basically the same meaning because I, Samadhi existed in the prior to the Buddha. Uh, 
Uh, I don't know if you have read, if you know a little bit about the heart of the Buddha, he's not talking about it by having teachers, and, and these are the teachers that very likely were part of the Brahmanical tradition, and they taught Samadhi as well. Then. So basically, it's the same thing. What the difference is the interpretation of the Samadhi. Yeah? Mm -hmm. What does it actually mean? In the Hindu tradition, they tend to uh, see Samadhi as an ending its own right. But, yeah? but in the Buddha, we try to actually see Samadhi more as a tool, if you like, on the path. Basically the same thing. And it's not just, you know, I mean, Samadhi is accessible basically for anyone. doesn't matter if you are Hindu or there are people, you know, some of the Christian mystics have been made in the of them. They have states that look very much like Samadhi. And, and I think almost all religious traditions that have a contemplative side of them that have some degree of access to Samadhi and have some level of anyway. And atheists who have Samadhi, yeah, if you live a difficult life, it doesn't matter how many religions have Samadhi. These are natural phenomena of the mind. Regardless of your uh, religion or lack of religion or whatever. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Yes? Um, does the teachings ever talk about how life started? Uh, you, I mean, you alluded to like illusion having yeah. like no cause, so it sort of always been around, and presumably yeah. you could have been so that life. But I mean, is, is the elimination of That you're not, you end the rebirth with that. Yeah. Is there any in, in terms of how it all started? How it started? Yeah. I mean, I can like remember it started. Yeah, like a big bang. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I mean, I've grown up as a Buddhist in Sri Lanka and yeah. I never really yeah. engaged with it in a, you know. You have to read the sutras, yeah? Read the sutras. It's that. all there. Yeah. It's all there. Yeah. All the sutras. Yeah. <laughs> There is, there is, yeah. My job is to tell people to read the Sutta, that's my only job. So I can just come here, sit down for five minutes, and say, read the Sutta, and I can walk out again. Yeah, we did enough. But, but I'm going to tell you something more anyway, just because I, because, uh, and, and what the Sutta say, and this is actually, it's actually very interesting, because what they, one of the things the Buddha says, and he says it in a number of different places, it says that, you, first of all, you cannot find the first uh, starting point of delusion, yeah. He also says you cannot find the first point of rebirth, yeah. You cannot find the first point of samsaric wandering and roaming around it. And uh, so what the Buddha says in effect, and he says this by you know, going back eons and eons, going back life after life, there's no first point to be discovered. Yet. This is interesting in many different ways. It is interesting because he doesn't say there is no first point. He says there is no first point to be discovered. Yet. Now this is actually a dramatic and a very important distinction. Because if you say there is no first point, you're making a philosophical claim about something you never actually know. And the Buddha was not really into philosophy in terms of speculation about things. He was into the practical applications of, of this. So what he says, you can't discover a first point, but it's quite different from saying that there is no first point. But uh, still, we are interested in the fact that we can't discover a first point as well. Yeah? Because what it means, basically, as you go back, and the Buddha claimed to have remembered lots and lots of past lives, and as you go back, there is, there is never any first cause to be found. There's always something before that. And uh, to me, this is a very rational way of looking at the universe. Uh, yeah, most uh, religions around the world, most even the world, they're part of the you know, purpose of religion is to kind of explain how the world started. Yeah, we go create the universe, yeah, back there it is. But what about God? You know, where does he come from? It doesn't really explain anything. If you just put God in place of the universe, it doesn't explain anything. Yeah, it's kind of very sensible, it's very true. So what the Buddha said, instead of actually there being a first point, no first point is discoverable. It just goes back and back and back. It is unsatisfactory in one way because we want explanations, but actually when you think about it, it's far more rational than looking at things. And to have a kind of a starting point, but suddenly everything bad came into existence. And even scientists say, say that. It's very, you know, one of the things that the scientists uh, have said is just that, well, you know, we can explain a whole universe. Uh, there's only one thing we can't explain. That's the very first big bang, how it comes into existence. And say, give us one free miracle, and we can explain everything else. <laughs> now, that science shouldn't say that. They give us one free miracle. That's not the right way for a scientist to think. That's basically what they have to say. Because they cannot explain the first starting point. Yet, it may come down the track of it. So that's why I'm, I'm just a bit like that. Some of these things are actually very, very powerful. Uh, and we 
because they uh, fit with common sense, I actually I think this one of the things I'm actually very uh, happy to uh,
Yeah, of course, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you, you know, again, read the sutras, you know, the genre is almost always the, you know, one of the, it's, it's part, it's almost a bit part of the path, yeah, and it's part of, uh, part of all these things, but yeah. Yes? Yeah. Uh, does the Sukhuda uh, offer guidance on um, the distinction between intentional actions and uh, actions which are the result of confusion or heedlessness, and in terms of the karmic consequences of each and whether they are comparable? Um, uh, heedlessness and, uh, and confusion. Yeah. Whether that's bad karma, you mean? Yeah. Um, well, yes, it would be. Yeah. So, I mean, confusion would basically be like moha. Yeah, moha. You have the three kind of roots of actions. Uh, uh, dosa moha. Yeah. And lo, for those who don't know, loba is then greed or desire. Dosa is anger or will. Uh, and the moha is delusion or confusion. Yeah. So it is. Uh, so, so that's why you have to be careful. If you feel really confused about something, don't make a decision when you're confused about things. Yeah. The art of decision making is actually very interesting here yeah, because. We have to make so many decisions in life, and we have to make sure we do it, do it in, a, in a wise way. Yeah? And the, one of the principal ways of making sure that we make sound decisions in life uh, is to make sure that you are in a good state of mind. Yeah? You are at peace, you are relaxed, you have a sense of clarity about yourself. Uh, that is when you should make a decision, not when you feel confused or angry. Never make a decision when you're angry, because you're bound to make mistakes when you do that. Uh. So for that reason, if you are confused, be very careful. It's very likely that you make a mistake. Yeah? It's precisely because of the confusion. Of course, if you are aware that you are confused, it's going to be help a little bit because you're going to kind of re restrain yourself a little bit. You ideally, wait in that kind of state. But the main point is that uh, when you, and that is only bad if it isn't motivated by that confusion. Yeah, it is. So the driving force for that volitional or that intentional activity has to be the confusion itself. So if you are really confused about what's going on, think, oh yeah, I'm confused, okay, I'm just going to do this, or whatever. So you are driven by that, that is where the problem arises. The same thing with the heedlessness. If you are really, if you are heedless, in other words, not careful about what, how you're supposed to live and all these kind of things, if that heedlessness is what drives your activity, that is where it gets problematic. But if you understand, okay, I'm heedless now, I've got to be really careful, then it is something else that is motivating your action, then it's not such a, such a big problem. You see, so it is actually the motivation that is a significant factor here. Yeah? What is driving your activity? Yeah? Uh, and motivation, it's not, it's not just about being confused, it's about whether that confusion is the thing that drives your actions. So. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, is Sukhuda is the illusion actually like the, um, the opposite of consciousness? Or is consciousness, is consciousness a, is the way that you work with consciousness? Moving it towards a more positive state. So, yeah. I think I think because you started out with talking about delusion, it is still it's still a delusion at the beginning at the beginning of the process. Yeah. Is that is that the absence of consciousness, or is it no. just the way that you work with consciousness which can work towards? It's more like the way you work with consciousness. It's the delusion is an aspect of consciousness. Yeah. Okay. Consciousness is just awareness itself, and the delusion is kind of is one of the factors that kind of affects your consciousness. So. Or affects your mind. If you can, can imagine that life, life is really like experience. Yeah, that's what life. Life consists of a large number of experiences connected together. Yeah? And part of that experience is like you know, okay, you see things right now. This is kind of four. Yeah, you see things. You feel things. You perceive things. You perceive you know chandeliers or whatever. Kind of chandeliers, pretty cool. Kind of. <laughs> and so you have. Whatever it is, yeah? And so you perceive things, and you have intentions or volitions that drive you. Yeah? And then you have consciousness, which is the ability to be aware of things. Yeah? But your consciousness will, uh, is always uh, the kind of the, uh, what your consciousness feels like, whether it is conjoined with good feelings or bad feelings, uh, that will depend on all your uh, intentional activities. Yeah? And sometimes consciousness is conjoined with delusion. Yeah, you can delude it. So your awareness is deluded in a sense. Yeah? So our job is to purify that awareness as much as possible, to remove the constraints on the awareness. Uh, because as long as it is constrained, you can't really act properly. You don't know what is for your own benefit or for other people's benefit. Uh, so we take away those defilements, we take away those constraints, uh, and it enables you to actually be better as a consequence. Uh. So these are all interrelated, but they're not actually, they're slightly different angles on, on, you know, on this problem. Uh, to, uh, So if we say let's meditate, so do we just choose the breath?
and that will teach us um, the reality, the energy of God. And then you go to Samadhi, and then you go to the Anapana, um, the 15 steps, you go through that, those stages. Or do you sort of say, oh, we're lifting this uh, Vipassana meditation? And if that's the case, what exactly do you do in a Vipassana meditation? Okay. Yeah. Well, this is, this is one of those very interesting things that people always ask you about, the Samadhi meditation, Vipassana meditation. The one is, the most interesting thing about this is that if you read the suttas, the Buddha never talks about Vipassana meditation or Samatha meditation, he just talks about meditation, yeah? So this is a very modern kind of terminology that really arose in Burma in the late 19th century. Yeah? The very famous, uh, uh, very famous scholar in Burma called Lady Sayadaw, who basically started this kind of whole Vipassana meditation movement. And he influenced Mahasi Sayadaw, he influenced the Great Great Tradition. All the main Vipassana Buddhists were influenced by Lady Sayadaw. And it's a historical development that came out of Burma. Yeah, so it's a very specific thing, it's a historical context. It is not really how the Buddha taught meditation. I'm not saying it is wrong, yeah, I'm just saying that this is a particular interpretation of the sutta that arose in Burma at a particular time. But if you don't look at how the Buddha explains things, he just talks about meditation as such. And then, uh, the way that he used the words vipassana and samatha, he used them not as meditation objects or meditation techniques, but as qualities of the mind. Yeah? So samatha means the calm aspect of the mind, vipassana means the clear seeing aspect of the mind. I prefer clear seeing to insight, I think it's more appropriate translation. So there are two aspects of the mind, and when you meditate in the right way, regardless of what object you use, whether you use the feelings in the body, you use the breath, you use a you know, you use a death contemplation or whatever it is, and if you do meditation right in the right way, you get both samatha and vipassana at the same time. These things too are always conjoined. Why are they conjoined? And the reason is because they have the same cause. What is the cause? The cause is, that, is the reduction of defilements. And the way to understand this is that if you have, you know, if you, if you have defilements in your mind, yeah, if you have desire or ill will or whatever, desire always uh, 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 it kind of agitates the mind. You think it makes you think about things. How can I get this? You always go into the future. Yeah, desire is always about the future. Ill will is often about the past. They said this to me. How can they say this to me? Yeah, it's terrible. Right? You know, they are even Buddhists still say this thing. Oh, that's really terrible. So you, you think like that. Yeah, no. this monks are this. This monks are supposed to be nicer. Yeah, how can they say these things? Etc. Etc. So. Um, it always takes you out of, the, out of the present moment. It doesn't make you peaceful. Then. So defilements take you away from peace. Uh, when you have defilements of the mind, uh, when you have desire, you have a vested interest in the object of your desire. Yeah? If you have a, someone you are very kind of attached to, or you're in love with, or you have a child or whatever, if a child misbehaves in public, have you got any children then? Yes, children then. Have you got children? No, you have got children, okay. If, if, if your child misbehaves in public, no, oh, don't do that, yeah, come. Is, you know that. Why? Because, in part, because if it reflects on you, know, yeah, this is my child, I'm not kind of doing the bringing properly, yeah? So it becomes like this thing, and so we have a vested interest in how the people uh, that we are close to us, how they, how they live, yeah? If you get too attached to the monks, yeah, and think, oh, this monk and this nun, they're so wonderful, and one day we misbehave, yeah? You feel so disappointed, yeah? You have the vested interest in your monk, this is my monk or my nun, yeah? This is kind of ours, so they're going to behave in the right way, yeah? So when you have desires, when you have your will, you have vested interest, you can't see things clearly according to reality. You see things in accordance with that attachment that you have to this particular person. So, because of that, you don't have clear seeing. So this is the problem, is that the root cause of both lack of clear seeing and lack of calm is the same. So by eliminating the departments of the mind, you get both calm and clear seeing, both samatha and vipassana. So the job of a meditator is to reduce the defilements. So whatever meditation you, you use that reduces your defilements in the long run will produce both samatha and vipassana. You get both insight or both clear seeing and calm as a consequence. And one of the wonderful things that the Buddha says in the sutta is that if you practice just watching the breath, yeah, it's so easy to watch the breath. It can't get much easier than that actually. You know, we say it's easy, but people still can't do it. But it's very, very easy, supposedly. You just watch the breath, then. and according to the Buddha, you can watch the breath, and if that's all you do, and it can take you all the way to awakening, according to the Anapanasati Sutta. 
by watching the brand, we fulfill the four uh, applications of mindfulness, the four Satipatthana. We fulfill simply by watching the brand. Uh, we fulfill the seven factors of awakening, uh, and you eventually you fulfill awakening itself. Uh, all you have to do is watch the humble breath. Uh, yeah, it's like a nice uh, you sit back in. And when the breath is delightful, when you're feeling calm and relaxed, and you get joy coming with it, it's such a beautiful thing. Uh, and it's so simple. Uh, and it takes you all the way to awakening. One of the suttas I will be doing, on the, I'm going to teach a retreat after this. Uh, I'm going to do the Anapanasati Sutta. Uh, yeah? So you are, are you coming to the retreat? Uh, yes, okay, good. So you will be there and you will know all about how to apply the Anapanasati in such a way. Yeah. Okay, please. Go you know, in uh, modern mindfulness uh, teachings, they talk about non judgmental awareness. In a, uh, in a sentence, it is, because one of the things that I didn't say, which I would have had more time before, uh, is that in this uh, sequence of uh, dependent liberation, uh, one of the things that Buddha says there, he says that this is not to be done by will. Na chetanaya teraniya. Chetanaya, chetana is the will, uh, not to be done through will. Uh, where actually, it's more like this, is, yeah, this cannot be done through using the will. Uh, so what that means is that when you watch the breath, when you kind of do your meditation or like whatever it is, uh, if you're not going to use the will, well there's only one other way, and that is to allow it to happen naturally. Uh, yeah? And that is what non-judgmental awareness really is. You don't actually try to control anything. Uh, you try just to be aware of things that they are. Uh. So in one way, there is an idea of non-judgmental awareness. But on the other hand, uh, uh, it is also the case that in Buddhism, as your mind becomes more peaceful, you're actually directed towards certain objects. Uh, yeah? So we try to use the breath as an object of the awareness. Uh, so in that, that sense, it is a little bit judgmental in the sense that you eliminate everything else uh, to just be able to follow the breath. Uh. So there is some truth to that, uh, but there's also some limitation to that idea. Uh, yeah? But when you kind of bring it together like that, then you, uh, I think you are on the right track. Uh. Okay, good, excellent, yeah, nice to meet you all. <laughs> so, uh, uh, that's it, so, then I will do now. Anyhow, you want to take the microphone? No. no? Does not want to take the microphone, okay. Should we just bow to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha as we finish off? Is that a nice thing to do then? Let's just uh, do that as a nice finishing off. Don't have to do it if you don't want to, but you are welcome to do something.